let's say you get the genetic testing and you're doing this at home and you're getting the results delivered back. First of all, you don't know the relevance of these uh, results if you're not uh, in, in the group where it has been well-defined. Mm -hmm. So how do does someone uh, who's, who's exposing themselves to, to this information assimilate what it means in their homes, in a rural area, without uh, a, a genetic counselor available, without sociology support. And the other question is uh, the um, the infusions are, are very demanding. They're an hour or more because then you have to sit around and make sure you're not having a, a, a an infusion reaction. Uh, and with donanumab, the Eli Lilly, Lilly drug, it's, it's, it's once a month. With lecanumab, the ASI drug, it's twice a month. But they are developing subcutaneous formulations that you can self-administer at home, which is great. It's a great advancement. But the one of the major side effects is the so-called aria, amyloid-related imaging abnormalities, which has has symptoms like dizziness, headache. Mm -hmm. uh, in which case, you have to get back to your doctor, and you need to go in for a, a safety um, MRI brain scan. How do you do that? when you're living in a rural environment. So how, how do we actually break these barriers down that you're suggesting that we need to do, which I agree with completely, but I'm not sure how to do it. Yeah, I, I my thoughts always go back to the policies that support the payments, right? Um, we have to think about making sure that we expand access by thinking about policies and payments in more applicable ways. Um, and that's a that's an ongoing conversation for people. Um, and it's going to be, an, I think it's going to be an ongoing conversation as the geographics of where care is being able to be delivered and how care can be delivered shifts, you know, because if we do things like support telehealth, uh, then maybe it's easier to say to a physician, um, a physician assistant, a nurse practitioner, a provider of some sort, hey, I'm having dizziness. Can you please consider prescribing an MRI, right? That's one less barrier is at least getting in front of someone who can start the paperwork and the order to get you those tests. Um, we have seen radiologists and radiology groups be really interesting in how, you know, like at least in my hospital, the pet comes on um, an RV, like once a week, you know? Um, and so that means that this PET scanner is going around places delivering care, right? Um, and I'm sure that there are like MRIs on wheels somewhere, you know, or something like that. So being, being really careful about how we think about policy and payment and, and using those to build infrastructure that can support people to get the care that they need is the long-term answer. Is there a short-term answer? I don't think so. I think we have tried expanding providers in lots of different ways. I think we try to incentivize medical students to go into primary care. I think we, we're, we're opening new medical schools. We're saying that um, APPs, like nurse practitioners, um, can practice in more unique ways to support communities that need to have clinicians um, in places that maybe there are not a lot of physicians. Um, so those, those things are already happening. But the long-term answer is going to be how we um, really think about how we pay for things and we support the infrastructure with the policies around it. <laughs>